The Sign of the Beaver by Elizabeth George Spear A Dell Yearling Book A Newberry Honor Book Reading Level 5.7 Chapter 21 Then one morning, Atien returned. Matt had been waiting, watching the forest trail impatiently, unwilling to go far from the cabin, lest he miss the boy's coming. But when finally he saw Etienne approaching, his heart sank. Etienne was not alone. His grandfather stalked by his side. Matt sensed that this meant trouble. Perhaps Sockness had come to reproach him. He would surely know that the two boys had been neglecting those lessons. Dreading to face the old man, Matt walked out to meet him, courteously giving the greeting he had learned. Sockness returned his greeting with dignity. He did not smile. His solemn face made Matt's heart sink still lower. Then, startled, Matt turned toward Etienne. He did not dare to ask a question, but he saw at once that there was no need to ask. No doubt about it, Etienne had found his Manitou. He had changed. He stood straighter and taller. He looked older, and Matt suddenly realized why. The black hair, which had always hung straight down almost to his shoulders, was shaved away. His scalp, like his grandfather's, was bare except for a single patch running back from his forehead and braided into a top knot fastened with red string. Like the fresh bear grease that glistened on his skin, pride glistened all over him. Moreover, he carried a gleaming new rifle. You've got a gun! Matt cried, politeness forgiven. My grandfather traded many beaver skin, Etienne answered. Though he had in these last days become a man, he had not learned altogether to hide his feelings. He did not say more. He waited now for his grandfather to speak. The old man's face was grave, but he did not ask about the lessons. Time of sun gets shorter, he said, like footsteps of bird. Soon ice on water. I know it's October, Matt said, maybe November. He had not wanted to count his sticks these last weeks. Indian go north now, Sockness continued. Hunt moose, all Indians go. Etienne not come more to learn white men's signs. Matt could not answer. White father not come, Sockness went on. Matt spoke quickly. He ought to be here any day now. Sockness looked at him soberly. Maybe him not come, he said quietly. Anger flared up in Matt. He could not allow this man to speak the fear he had never dared to admit to himself. Of course he'll come, he said too loudly. He might even come today. Snow come soon, Sockness persisted. Not good, white boy, stay here alone. White boy, come with Indians. Matt stared at him. Did he mean go on the hunt with them? The most important hunt of the year? Sockness smiled for the first time. Sockness teach white boy hunt moose like Etienne. White boy, it Etienne, be like brother. A sudden joyful hope sprang into Matt's mind. He realized at this moment just how anxious he had been. This was the way out. He did not have to stay here all alone through the whole winter. Then, as swiftly as it had come, this new hope died away. In spite of his longing, in spite of being afraid, he knew what he had to answer. Thank you, he said. I'd like to go on the hunt, but I can't do that. If, when my father comes, he wouldn't know where I'd gone. Leave white man's writing. Matt swallowed hard. Something might happen to the cabin. He's trusting me to take care of it. Maybe him not come. Sockness said again, not smiling now. He'll be here soon, Matt insisted. He was ashamed that his voice broke in the middle of the word. If he couldn't come, he'd send someone to tell me. He'd find some way no matter what happened. You don't know my pa. Sockness was silent for some time. White boy, good son, he said at last. But better you come. Sockness glad for white boy, me, be, McGuinness. Matt could only keep shaking his head. The man's words had brought a great lump in his throat. Thank you, he managed. You've been very good to me, but I have to stay here. Without another word, Sockness held out his hand. Matt put his own hand into that bony grasp. Then the two Indians turned and went away. Etienne had not even said goodbye. There would be no lesson that morning, no story, no tramping in the forest or fishing, not this morning or any other morning. Close to panic, Matt wanted to run after them. He wanted to tell them that he had changed his mind, that he would go with them anywhere rather than stay here alone with winter coming on. But he set his jaw tight and stood where he was. After a few minutes, he reached for his axe and fell to splitting logs with a fury. 
He couldn't keep from thinking, however. Was he just being foolish and stubborn? Wasn't going with them the wisest thing he could have done? And wouldn't his father have understood? He remembered hearing that many white men, and white women too, who had been captured by the Indians and had lived many years in the wilderness, did not want to return to the white world when they had a chance, but had chosen instead to live with the Indians. He had never understood that, but now he could see very well how it might happen. He no longer distrusted them. He knew that Aitian and his grandmother would be kind, that even the grandmother would make him welcome, and that they would share with him whatever they had, no matter how little. He had found friendship and goodwill in their cabin. He had envied Aitian his free, unhampered life in the forest, and the boisterous comradeship in the village. If he had been taken captive as a child and raised as an Indian boy, how would he himself have chosen? It wouldn't be the same to make that choice deliberately. He was proud that they had wanted him to live with them, but he knew that he could never really be proud, as Aitian was proud, of being a hunter. He belonged to his own people. He was bound to his own family, as Aitian was bound to see his grandfather. The thought that he might never see his mother again was sharper than hunger or loneliness. This was the land his father had cleared to make a home for them all. It was his own land, too. He could not run away. He was troubled that Aitian had walked away without a word of farewell. Had he been offended? Had he really wanted Matt to go with them, to be a brother? Or was he only obeying his grandfather as he had had to do about the lessons? It was so hard to tell what Aitian was thinking. Aitian had become a hunter. He had a gun. He would not have time now to wander through the forest or to listen to stories. He would not have to bother any longer with a white boy who would never really be a mighty hunter. But surely Aitian could have held out his hand as his grandfather had done. Chapter 22 Every morning, in spite of himself, Matt kept an eye out for Aitian. When four days had gone by, he decided there was little chance that he would see his friend again. Doubtless the Indians had already left the village and were on their way north. So when he saw Aitian coming through the woods with his dog at his heels, he ran across the clearing to meet him, not bothering to hide his relief and pleasure. "'You think different?' Aitian asked quickly. "'You go with us?' Matt's eagerness died away. No, he said unhappily. Please try to understand, Etienne. I must wait for my father. <coughs> Etienne nodded. I understand, he said. My grandfather understand, too. I do same for my father if he still live. The two boys stood looking at each other. There was no amusement and no scorn in Etienne's eyes. How very strange, Matt thought. After all the brave deeds he had dreamed of to win this boy's respect, he had gained it at last just by doing nothing, just by staying here and refusing to leave. My grandfather send you gift, Haitian said now. He unstrapped from his back a pair of snowshoes. They were new, the wood smooth and polished, the netting of deer hide woven in a neat design. Before Matt could find words, Haitian went on. My grandmother send gift, he said. He took from his pouch a small birch basket of maple sugar. Late in the season like this, Matt knew... Sugar was scarce and dear to the Indians. Thank you, he said. Tell your grandmother that when you come back, I'll help gather more sap for her. Etienne was silent. Not come back, he said then. In the spring, I mean, when the hunt is over. Not come back, Etienne repeated. Not live in village again. Our people find new hunting ground. But this is your home! My people hunters. My grandfather say many white men come soon. Cut down trees, make house, plant corn. Where my people hunt? What could Matt answer to this? He had only one argument to offer. Your grandfather wants you to learn to read, he reminded Etienne. I haven't been much of a teacher, but when my family comes, it will be different. My mother will teach you to read and to write, too. What for I read? My grandfather mighty hunter, my father mighty hunter. They not read. Your grandfather wants you to be able to understand treaties, Matt insisted. We go far away. No more white men. Not need to sign paper. An uncomfortable doubt had long been troubling Matt. Now, before Etienne went away, he had to know. This land, he said slowly, this place where my father built his cabin, did it belong to your grandfather? Did he own it once? How one man own ground? Etienne questioned. Well, my father owns it now. He bought it. I not understand, Etienne scowled. How can man own land? Land same as air. Land for all people to live on, for beaver and deer. Does deer own land? How could you explain, Matt wondered, to someone who did not want to understand? 
Somewhere in the back of his mind there was a sudden suspicion that Etienne was making sense, and he was not. It was better not to talk about it. Instead he asked, Where will you go? My grandfather say much forest where sun go down. White men not come so far. To the west. Matt had heard his father talk about the west. There was good land there for the taking. Some of their neighbors in Quincy had chosen to go west instead of buying land in Maine. How could he tell Etienne that there would be white men there, too? Still, they said there was no end of the land in the west. He reckoned there must be enough for both white men and Indian. Before he could think what to say, Etienne spoke again. I give you gift, he said. Dog like you. I tell him stay with you. You mean you're not taking him with you? No good for hunt, Etienne said. Walk slow now. Good for stay here with Madabe, with white brother. Etienne's careless words did not deceive Matt. He knew very well how Etienne felt about that no-good dog that followed him everywhere he went. And Etienne had said white brother. Matt could not find the words he needed, but he knew there was something he must do. He had to have a gift for Etienne, and he had nothing to give, nothing at all that belonged to him. Robinson Crusoe? What could that mean to a boy who would never now learn to read it? He did have one thing. At the thought of it, something twisted tight in his stomach but it was the only thing he could have that could possibly match the gifts Etienne had given him. Wait here, he told Etienne. He went into the cabin and took down the tin box. The watch was ticking away inside it. He had never forgotten to wind it, not even when he was too tired to not to stick. Now he lifted it out and held it in his hand, the way he had held it when his father had given it to him, as though it were a fragile bird egg. His father would never understand. Before he could think about it another minute, Matt hurried back to where Etienne stood waiting. I have a gift for you, he said. It tells the time of day. I'll show you how to wind it up. Etienne held the watch even more carefully. There was no mistaking that he was pleased and impressed. Probably, Matt thought, Etienne would never learn to use it. The sun and the shadows of the trees told him all he needed to know about the time of day. But Etienne knew that Matt gifts, Matt's gift was important. Fine gift, he said. He put the watch very gently into his pouch. Then he held out his hand. Awkwardly, the two boys shook hands. Your father comes soon, Etienne said. I hope you get the biggest moose in Maine, Matt answered. Etienne turned and walked into the woods. The dog sprang up to follow him. Etienne motioned him back and uttered one stern order. Puzzled, the dog sank down and put his chin between his paws. As Etienne walked away, he whined softly, but he obeyed. Matt knelt down and put his hand on the dog's head.